in the incredible final sequence, we go beyond today's science, as we must, into the realm, into a realm which I think can best be described as spiritual. And here we're up against a, a very difficult problem, because you know in the last few weeks there's been this tremendous excitement among the astronomers over the extraordinarily precise and rhythmic radio pulses coming from the direction of the point between Vega and Altair, which may yet turn out to have a natural explanation, but its periodicity and characteristics are so extraordinary that no explanation as yet seems very feasible. Sooner or later, we expect we will receive proof that other intelligence exists in this universe. This may come next week. It may not come for a hundred years. But I think this movie will serve, besides its purpose as entertainment, it may help to prepare the human race for something that inevitably will come. Thank you. If you have any questions to ask Mr. Clark, would you please uh, indicate them? Mr. Clark would be pleased to attempt to answer them for you. Before putting Mr. Clark back on, I want to thank him on behalf of MGM and want to state unequivocally that MGM is not responsible uh, for these sounds from outer space. Uh, I want to thank you very much. I'm sure that the uh, people will enjoy. Uh, hearing your answers to any of the questions which uh, may provoke them at this time. And uh, that's all. Thank you, Father. Okay. Well, I'll be very glad to do what I can to field your queries. Well, yes, would you care to make uh, one or two comments on the possibility of a relatively close uh, extraterrestrial civilization giving us, say, millions of years of advanced technological knowledge in perhaps a hundred years' time? This is perfectly possible. And in fact, even if we did not establish two-way communication, even if, if we only sort of picked up signals from space, suppose, in fact, well, here's, here's an example. Uh, suppose the USA of 1868 was able to pick up your television transmissions today. Now, they would see the sort of technology that exists today. They wouldn't know how it, how it worked, but even seeing that, seeing automobiles, airplanes, and all these things, that would be half the battle. They would know these things could be done, and then they would be done. So even a one-way reception of this sort of material could have a revolutionary impact on our society. And of course, it could be too great a shock. There's this is what anthropologists call cultural shock. When one culture very much higher than another, when two cultures impinge, the fatal conflict, um, and then it can be disastrous. This is why I think it's advisable to prepare as far as possible for this kind of thing, because I'm sure it is inevitable. When you, when you say fatal conflict, sir, it would be... No, I, I would imagine that, that a, 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 an intelligence that far in advance <laughs> would understand the dangers of war or of intemperate diplomatic action or whatever between uh, <coughs> solar systems. You're quite right, of course. A really advanced culture would know about these dangers and would probably have been through this kind of thing many times and would know how to prevent this happening if it wished to. But it might not wish to. We don't know. They would regard us perhaps as a dangerous species of lower life to be... Henry the Flit. You know? <laughs> Uh, what did you mean, please, by, by the uh, term a metaphysical concept? What, what conception of, of metaphysical does this involve? Well, I was using that in a, a general term of something, you know, so much beyond our present technology and, and resources and engineering that it is almost spiritual. Are you familiar with the... Uh, Sir John Eccles' views on life and the universe, he is a Nobel laureate in neurology. It is his opinion that the Earth is the only place in the universe that is inhabited by highly intelligent beings. He says uh, 
Most of these statements about uh, higher life come from engineers and physicists who know nothing about bi biology. And he says they don't realize how uh, tremendously complex the human organism is. He doesn't think it could happen twice in one universe. He is quite right. <laughs> I'm sure... I'm, I'm trying to shoot this idea of uh, highly intelligent yeah. uh, people full of holes, if you don't mind. <laughs> he is quite right in thinking the human organism probably does not occur twice in one universe. We are the product of a long chain of chance events which decided we should have five fingers instead of six and our two eyes should be here and not, and not this away. It should work almost as well. And that our ma we are possibly, probably unique because we have adapted for our surroundings. But there must be millions of worlds on which life has evolved. We know now approximately how this happens. And there will be life forms on those, but none of them, I'm sure, will be sufficiently cl like us that we would like mistake them for human beings, except on a very uh, gloomy and smoggy afternoon <laughs> or dark night. Uh, I am sure that there are many life forms that would look, you know, they have the same r uh, uh, engineering outlines, two arms, two legs, but they, w they wouldn't be human, and this uh, human by definition almost is, is us. Um, would you care to predict or, pro or forecast when a unified field theory in physics may be available to us which might possibly allow <coughs> controlled gravity as a propulsion system? Well, it'd be lovely if we could control gravity, uh, but I'm afraid it's rather outside my sphere of, uh, of competence. And I heard a skeptical remark by one of my physicist friends that anti-gravity is for the birds. Well, I, I, I suspect that one day we will get some means of propulsion or control better than rockets, which are rather uh, noisy. You may have remembered Walter Cronkite trying to hold the window in from three miles away from the Saturn launch. And we may have gravity control or something like this, but we need a new breakthrough in physics. But of course, we always do get new breakthroughs eventually. And when the, the human race wants anything badly enough, it usually gets it. And sometimes when it doesn't. May I be pedestrian and ask you about the unidentified flying objects? <laughs> <laughs> well, can I be pedestrian and give a, a brief reply? One, uh, if you've never seen an unidentified flying object, you are very unobservant. Two, if you've seen as many as I have, you won't believe in them. Uh, three, they have nothing to do with visitors from space. Four, it is impossible to prove three. <laughs> Reducing the focus of this discussion to a somewhat more domestic political level, sir, do you think this film may change the climate of opinion and make the people, and through them our government, more receptive to expanded expenditures in space research? I sincerely hope so. And um, in fact, I'm fairly sure of this. It will, uh, perhaps we've got to wait, we've got to bypass the older generation and the current people in Congress and the, uh, the young people will be doing this. But um, there is a big educational problem here and there's a grave danger that this country is gonna be Sputnik again just 10 years after it happened the first time. The Russians have a, the Russian planetary space program is far more extensive than the American one and far more determined, and although it has been far less successful. In almost every field, the United States is far ahead of the USSR in space exploration, in the, in the hardware, the technology, the scientific results. But in one <laughs> vital field, of course, the USSR is ahead in the building of big man-rated boosters. And uh, I think it's no longer a secret that they have a or will have so on a booster bigger than the Saturn V. And um, also I think they're ahead in determination and understanding of what space means, because this goes back 50 years to the writings of Tsiolkovsky. That all the pioneering works on space were published in Russia. They've always had a great interest in the subject. Even before the revolution, I don't know, it's an interesting psychological study why this should be. So there's a sort of feeling of determination there. And this is 